So what we're going to do today is actually just do some philosophy. We're going to do the kind of thing that we do in a philosophy course, and uh, you're going to get kind of a taste for what it is that we do when we do philosophy and the kind of things that we're trying to figure out and the kind of questions that we're trying to answer. So in particular, we're going to look at an ethical question and a political question. Um, so first of all, what, uh, do you guys know what ethics means? What would you say ethics is? Anybody want to spitball a definition? Yeah? Morality of choice. Morality? What does morality mean? A lot of times ethics and morality get used in the same as synonyms. In it's kind of like your own like kind of like rules for like what you think is hurtful and what's not. What you think is hurtful? A lot of times uh, whether something is hurtful has to do with uh, the moral valence of an action, right? Whether an action is moral or immoral. Broadly, in terms of philosophy and the way philosophy is broken down, ethics and morality is one of the branches of philosophy. And ethics and, and morality has to do with what the right thing to do is. And that's different from like, what the thing that's going to be in your best interest is to do at any given time, right? So when you're a child, sometimes um, you get told uh, that, I don't know, this, this happened to any of you where, I know this happened to me, where my mother caught me when I was a child like taking a piece of candy from the grocery store, and then I had to go back and you know, say, admit it. And uh, does this happen to anybody else? No? No, I'm the only beef. Yeah. Um, stealing's wrong, right? That's why parents teach their children not to steal. But one thing we want to do in philosophy is not just get a list of things that are wrong. We want to know why the things that are wrong are wrong. This is one of the things we do in philosophy is we try to come up with some principles whereby if we apply the principle to an action, we'll be able to tell whether or not that action is right or wrong. And one of the ways we do this in philosophy is we try to think up some thought experiments um, and we try to think, all right, well, let's think of something that uh, we know the right ethical answer to and let's see if we can deduce some kind of rule from that example and then we'll know what the rule is when we go to apply it in some new situation. So, uh, and I'll, I'll just say, like, these examples are, uh, they might seem a little grisly, um, but that's just because this is what we do in philosophy. We want, we want um, ex thought experiments that have obvious answers. So let's just suppose, has anybody heard of the trolley problem before? We're going to walk through the trolley problem because a lot of people think, um, I think a lot of people have an idea about what the trolley problem is supposed to show. And sometimes I find when I'm teaching it that it doesn't, what philosophers take from the trolley problem isn't what everybody else takes from the trolley problem. So let's go through it. Let's suppose you, this isn't you, this is the trolley. You are up here. Let's suppose you're on a trolley. <laughs> we uh, and this trolley is speeding along, um, and you're the only one on the trolley. And it just happens that you realize this trolley doesn't have any brakes. Um, is that good or is that bad? That's bad, right? And you look up and you notice, oh my gosh, not only does this trolley not have any brakes, but here are five people they are on the tracks ahead of you. Did things get better or worse? Worse. Worse. What's gonna happen to these five people? They're gonna die. They're gonna die, right? Uh, in this thought experiment, the trolley is going really fast. And they're going to die, and you're on the trolley. And that's not good. Right? Um, but let's suppose instead, uh, in addition to this, there's a lever. And this lever can switch from, 
subtract A, subtract B. Should you switch to track B? Yes. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Great. Uh, However, there is one person on track B. Is the answer still that you should pull the lever? Now let's specify here. Who are these people? Do you know them? No. No, no you don't. Do you know this person? No, you don't. Are these people innocent? Yes, yes all of them. Um, and let's also specify, just because this comes up sometimes too, you can't like jump the trolley or you know <laughs> throw your ring in the thing so it pops off or whatever. This is a thought experiment. And one of the fun things about philosophy thought experiments is, you know who's in control of the thought experiment? Me, because it's my thought experiment. Right? <laughs> You get to make whatever rules you want when you're doing thought experiments. So there's no options for you except to pull the lever or not pull the lever. If you pull, you switch from track A to track B. How many people think the right thing to do here is to pull the lever? Great. Uh, this is actually the answer that almost everybody gives. So since it does seem to be unanimous, remember what I said. Um, what we're trying to do in philosophy is to try, you know, is the trolley problem really about what to do if you find yourself on a runaway trolley? Mm -hmm. Like, are philosophers really worried about trolley accidents? No, we're not. Um, what we are worried about, though, is the principles that you use to make this decision in this case. So, what is the principle that you're using to make this decision here? There's less people on track B. There's less people on track B. That's true, right? But you need a moral principle that tells us why we should. Because you're going to kill more people if you don't have track B. Yeah, of your two choices, pulling the lever results in less overall death. Is that the case? Yeah. Is that the principle that we're using when we make this decision and why we all think we should be pulling the lever here? Yes. Yes? All right. Have we found a valid moral principle then? Maybe. Ah, <laughs> maybe somebody has had a philosophy class before. Um, I was here last year. Oh, okay. Well, then you know that uh, what we generally do in philosophy classes, in addition to trying to figure out moral principles, is we try to get you to touch the stove um, and then tell you, haha, you burned your finger, right? Um, so maybe we can complicate this. Um, let's take away your lever. Let's take away track B. Let's take away this guy. And let's even take away this. Let's take away you too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> This is just bad news for these people, right? Yeah. Uh, let's put you up on an overpass. You're up here. And you are just watching the trolley. It's going to go through here. I know it looks impenetrable, but uh, bear with me. Um, what would you like to do here if you're up here? Tell them to move, right? But unfortunately, again, it's my thought experiment, and you can't talk. Uh, you can't tell them to move, right? Now you only. Now it seems like they're kind of out of luck again, right? Except, let's put that guy right here now. And let's suppose that what you can do is give that guy a push. <laughs> and you can push this guy onto the tracks, and you know that the trolley will come to a grinding halt <coughs> over this person. How many people think what we ought to do in this case is push? I 
see a couple hands, but I... <laughs> How many people think what we ought to do in this case is not push? Told me we had a moral principle. And what did that moral principle say? Hey, you did. You're off the hook. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you just got hooked last year, though. Yeah. Yeah? Um, you're the one that's pushing. You're still the one that does the work. You're pushing. Yeah. Um, I mean, isn't this, is most people's intuition for why we shouldn't push that this kind of seems like murder in this case? Yeah. Right? You are, right? Uh, if, remember the moral principle we that we said we were operating with on the first case said, of two situations, if one of them results in less death, that's the one we should choose, right? <laughs> no, nope, nobody's looking. Remember, I'm in charge of the thought experiment. You can get away with it, right? <laughs> These people are going to help you cover up the crime. <laughs> Which of the two options satisfies the moral principle that we talked about earlier? Pushing. pushing the person. So, what's the hesitation to pushing in this case? Is it that like that it does seem like a murder because you're actually pushing them? Yeah, it's because you're not even involved in the first place. You're just a bystander now. So now, like, you're like involving yourself by pushing. So is it, if it's the bystander thing, can't we do this and we go like, oh, okay, well, if he's still down here, can't we give you the lever up here? <laughs> you think we should pull the lever here in this case? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's the touching, right? Is it the touching? Great, so we'll just put him right here on the platform. <laughs> and he can pull the lever and he gets drunk. Okay, no, no. It's bad sound. Yeah? I think it seems worse because in the first scenario, either way they would die, but in this scenario, that person would have to die if you didn't push them. In the first scenario, if you don't do anything, he's fine, right? And the trolley yeah, goes over Either way, like. in this is innocent. Uh, like, right? Well, yeah, they're innocent, but they're not like, 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 like part of the situation. They're just chilling on that platform. Right, they're chilling on the platform. They're minding their own business. But on the track, uh, when you're on the trolley, you have more responsibility for like what the trolley does, like what it runs over. I That's think. not what I'm trying to say. That's what I'm trying to say. That's what she feels. That's what she feels. But I think I'm trying to get to is Building off of what she said, if we don't pull the lever, that person had no possibility of dying in the first place. But if we give that person the possibility of dying, that would either way make us a murderer, but if we let it go, then that's just a catastrophe and the trial gone wrong. Isn't that, doesn't that operate on the first case though too? This person over here has no, they know like, this isn't the track the troll is using. I'm safe. They have no possibility of dying before we decide like, hey, one is better than five. So what's exactly. the, what do you think the point of the trolley problem is? What? Yeah. Remember, the trolley problem has nothing to do with trolleys, right? We can set this up as, you know, people in cars. Um, why do you think, why do you think philosophers get so worried about, why is it called the trolley problem? Why is this? Well, there are two ways to be perfectly consistent, right? One way to be perfectly consistent is to say, since you should pull the lever in the first case, you should push the person in the second case. 
because these two cases are completely isomorphic, right? The choices are uh, five deaths versus one death in each case. Does that make sense? The problem with that answer is that it seems to fly in the face of our moral intuitions. And it seems like uh, I have more confidence in my moral intuition that it's wrong to push the person in the second case than I do in my intuition that, well, I actually need to be consistent in all these trolley cases or whatever. Um, you might say something like, I don't know why the second case is different than the first one, but it certainly is. Is that the position most people are in? Okay, well, what the trolley problem actually elucidates is something like, we tend to operate um, based on these kinds of moral intuitions, like in cases where uh, we have a choice between more people or less people dying, we ought to choose the, case, the situation where less people die, where less people die. But we also have intuitions about what is and isn't morally permissible in terms of like, I think it's like proximity to making somebody, uh, pushing somebody to their death. Um, this is why it seems easier to pull the lever and switch it uh, to track B in the first case than it is to actually shove the person or even pull this lever in this case. And the point of the trolley problem is to show that these intuitions can come apart. So one of the ways that uh, one of my favorite philosophy professors described philosophy is thinking in really slow motion and trying to figure out exactly what it is you're doing when you're making the kind of evaluations that we all do every day. And one of the things that the trolley problem shows is that some of our moral intuitions can come into conflict. Now, if you're waiting for me to say, here's the answer to the trolley problem, I don't have the answer to the trolley problem. The trolley problem is a problem because it seems like if we're consistent, we give the wrong answer to at least one of these. And if we are inconsistent in the way that most of us were, and we said, uh, pull the lever in the first case, don't push in the second case, then it seems like we lack a theory for uh, why it's okay to make these two cases differently, or to uh, judge these two cases differently. Does that make sense? So one of the things we do in philosophy classes is to try to figure out, okay, well, what would be the theory that explains why it's uh, correct to pull the lever in the first case and correct not to push in the second case. And that's an exercise that I'm going to leave up to you guys. And we're going to go on to a different problem now. It too is going to involve death. Um, so don't worry. Uh, <laughs> um, How many people die every year because, or every day in America because they need an organ that they can't get? It's around 20. Um, sometimes I ask that and people look it up, up on their phone. And last time somebody did that, it was 20. Um, so we're going to go with that. Um, so around 20 people die every day because they need an organ and there aren't any organs available. Does that make sense? So keep that stat in your head for a second. Um, do you guys wear seatbelts in your car? Sometimes. Sometimes. Yes. I'm a real stickler about wearing my seatbelt. Uh, why do you wear seatbelts? They don't fly through the window. They don't fly through the window. Can seatbelts kill you? Yes. Yes, they can. So why are you strapping this dangerous thing that can kill you across your torso every time you get in the car? It's more dangerous. The chances of dying from a seatbelt injury versus the chances of dying from an injury without a seatbelt is like higher without one. Yeah. yeah. So before we had seatbelts, how many people died by uh, being trapped in their car from their seatbelt? None. None. Right. Before we had seatbelts, seatbelts didn't kill anybody. Right. Yeah. After. We have seatbelts. Do seatbelts kill people? Yes. 
Yes, but what kind of deaths went way down? Yeah, so when we didn't have seatbelts, nobody died from seatbelts, but a lot of people died from car accidents. After we have seatbelts, now a lot fewer people die from car accidents and more people die from seatbelts, but that sum of people who die in the, in the uh, seatbelt world is much less than the amount of people that die in a world where we don't have seatbelts. Does that make sense? Okay. Now keep that in your back pocket and we're going back to organs again. Um, suppose you and a friend uh, are both down on your luck and you both need organs. And you go to the hospital and you need a kidney and your friend needs a heart. And you go to the hospital and you say, I need a kidney. Your name is Justin and uh, Peter needs a heart because he is a heartless economist. And... Uh, <laughs> Um, and suppose the, uh, the doctor looks in his freezer and he goes, great, I've got, what do I need, a kidney? I need a kidney. There's a, I've got a kidney in here and a heart in here. Um, fantastic. And they give the heart to Peter and the kidney to me. That's good, right? Yeah. Fantastic. Um, what if me and Peter go in there and the doctor says, I've looked, I've opened the fridge. There's nothing in there. Um, that's bad, right? Then Peter and I die. Um, what if the doctor looks in the freezer and he says, uh, I've got some in here, but I don't know. You guys don't strike me as very cool. <laughs> Peter's an economist and we don't even have any hair left, so. <laughs> We're not gonna give them to you. Um, what would you say about the doctor in that case? That they're not following their, their oath. Maybe not following their oath. Would you say that the doctor's doing something wrong in that case? Yeah. Maybe something immoral? Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would say that's a little weird. Um, well, what if the doctor looks and he says, I've got no, um, there's no organs in the freezer. And me and Peter go, okay, but we notice that there's the other economist, Russ, and he's in the hospital, uh, and I see him in the room over, and, you know, he's under anesthesia. Um, I'll tell you what, Doc, why don't you cuss, cut, Rudd up, cut <laughs> Russ up and give Peter Russ's heart and give me Russ's kidneys? Yeah. The thing about thought experiments I remember again is that I get to be in charge of them, right? So whether or not they're illegal, let's push that off the table. What we want to be talking about is whether or not it's immoral or unjust, right? Um, we actually want our laws to reflect our morality, right? We usually settle questions of morality before we settle questions of legality. We think murder, we make murder illegal because we think murder is wrong. We don't think murder is wrong because it's illegal. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so uh, what do you think the doctor should say when I tell, um, when I tell him, why don't you just cut up Russ and give Russ's organs to me and Peter? Yeah. Why not though? Yeah, but it's safe being Peter, and two people, two people surviving is better than one person surviving, yeah? What if I just give Peter my heart, and then one person dies, and everybody else stays fine? Yeah. Well, then one person dies, but what's going to happen? I mean, I love how in this experiment, by the way, you say the other person, <laughs> not me. <laughs> <laughs> Just cutting up for us, we should have a policy 
a national policy where, let's just suppose organ, transplant, organ transplants have been perfected, um, right? I mean, they're not perfect right now. Sometimes bodies reject organs. But in a world where organ transplants are perfected, suppose I say anytime two or more people with the same blood type need an organ, what we do is we have a national lottery. We draw social security numbers, <laughs> and if your number gets picked, then we'll come up with some kind of euphemism for it. But what we're going to do is we will take the organs from the donor, and we will give them to the two or more people who uh, need the organs. Hold on, let me give you the full sales pitch. Um, <laughs> let's talk about seatbelts again, right? Um, so, in a world where we don't have any seatbelts, how many people die seatbelt deaths? Zero. Um, how many people die car accident deaths? Let's call that number X. Um, in a world with seatbelts, how many people die seatbelt deaths? Why? Why? Let's call it one. Good. Why? And how many people die car accident deaths in a world with seatbelts? Less X. Z. It's X divided by something like ten. Let's say. Sure. Right. And the reason. We wear seatbelts, and the reason we have seatbelt laws is because we think uh, that X is greater than Y plus X over 10, right? We think that more people die in this world than in this world, correct? Okay, let's do the Oregon lottery. Oregon lottery. A world where we don't have the organ lottery and a world where we do have the organ lottery. Let me just circle that one. Make a mistake. All right, so in an organ lottery world, in a world where we don't have the organ lottery, how many people die organ lottery deaths? None. Zero. How many people die uh, because they need an organ? Let's call these organ deaths. 20 a day, right? Okay. In a world with the organ lottery, how many people are going to die uh, because they need an organ? Well, you can't say zero. So it's going to be like one or zero, right? People, there'll be one person, so that'd be ten. It's probably going to be like zero or one, right? We're only for two people and one person dies. There's a two to one ratio. So I'm talking about people who die because they need an organ, not people who die oh, as a donor. Oh yeah, they need zero or one. Zero or one, right? Zero. Let's call it point five. How many people are going to die <laughs> as organ donors? No more than 10, right? 10 or less, right? Because for every person that gets donated, uh, we're saving at least two people, right? Well, let's do the seatbelt math again. Um, in a world without the organ lottery, 20 people are dying a day. In a world with the organ lottery, how many people are dying a day? <laughs> Around 10 and a half, right? So look, I'm with you on the seatbelts, right? I wear my seatbelt, um, even though I know it might kill me. Yeah? Right now, the policy we're considering is that uh, it applies to everybody, right? Okay, so, so we're killing children. So an 82-year-old man can oh. have heart failure, and a one-year-old baby will have to give up their heart because they may not draw in the water? Yeah.
Yeah, that doesn't make sense, right? And then you have people who are so let's uh, so have people who don't. We're going to take these objections one at a time, right? So we have the first objection is the age one, right? Which is hold on. Uh, I know that a lot of people in their 80s need organs, and it doesn't seem fair that somebody who's in you know their 20s or whatever. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I don't think that would even work in the first place, right? Well, no, but you did say it would. Yes. Uh, so we'll do it like the selective service as it is right now, right? Suppose I say something like, oh, if that's your objection to this, we could easily put a cap on the age at which you could benefit from the organ lottery. You can only benefit, it from, benefit from the organ lottery if you are under, say, 50. You can only be a donor in the organ lottery if you are over, say, I don't know, 30. Oh, that's oh, that's so, people with kids are getting. People, so, people with kids are getting yeah. chopped up and donated and yeah. leaving See, these kids. I feel like, yes. I feel like it should be I chopped up and donated. They are, however, we're saving more of them than uh, So we're Russ in this situation. So we're what? So we're Russ in this situation. We're Russ. The reason yeah. why it's different is because he- You know, Russ was, was dying. dying. <laughs> He's dead. That makes it even more justifiable. He's getting better. So, uh, what if it's someone who has um, a kidney stone or something like that and they just Oh yeah, you mean somebody who would be like donating a, uh, an organ that wouldn't work? Yeah, what if they had AIDS? Yeah, well then they would uh, yeah. be excluded okay, from the lottery, right? Assuming that they're excluded. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, do they have to go out like, isn't Yes, a sure. We, remember, this is a thought experiment. The point is this. For all of these objections that we're raising, remember, this is a thought experiment so I can just go like, oh yeah, we can screen out these people. Is that your real objection? If we answer this question, like, is that your real problem with it? Or do you think... I think there's something more problematic with this. And one of the yeah. reason why the organ donation thing is more disturbing is because seagull belts, although they do kill people, they're you're not directly killing people. Like for we don't, I, I'm not direct I don't I'm not advocating that the doctor directly kill us. I just say take his organs out and give them to me well, and then whatever happens not, to what happens. They don't have their organs, they <laughs> it's killing somebody that wouldn't have died in favor of somebody who's gonna die. In favor of more people, right? You're We're just trading. Matter, and, um, and giving their organs to a sick person yeah. who, who's more likely to die already. Anyway. Yeah, I feel like you're kind of hung up on this uh, sick person. Well, if they need organs, they're sick, right? Uh, maybe they're, not necessarily. They're something wrong. Are they just selling them? No, a lot of people need organs for things because they get in like accidents. So one of the other questions people well, they're, not, they're dying. Uh, if you get in a car accident, usually. They, the term you use is like injured, not sick, which refers to it, more refers to it. Okay, well, they're not in perfect health condition. Yeah, you're right. Uh, they're not in perfect health. That's why it's, we want to save as much of them as we can, right? Yeah. But they were already gonna die, but those people that you're killing to save them weren't gonna die. Anyway. I got news for you, I think. And they're all over gonna well, that's uh, not gonna kill them. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I think personally, my problem is the people that don't wear their seatbelts have a choice not to wear their seatbelts. Yeah. Um, we got seatbelt laws, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, but you can still you can make still choose not to do it. You still make your decisions. Still have I'm gonna stop you because we have a hand up. Yes. Um, you can use the organ donors from people who have died from car crashes to uh, to save the people who need it. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what we do now, right? Um, but the problem with the way we do things now is that still 20 people die a day, right? Um, well, we could have another chart that says that says if we do have this or we don't have this, it would be the same thing with the seat belts and no seat belts. We do we, so, and we do have it, so less people die of it. Same with having seat belts. Is the objection to the organ lottery that it's not voluntary? Yes. Yes. Um, should we make the seat belt thing voluntary too? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. You need to make the trade of choice. Yeah. So it's kind of voluntary. 
Yeah. Drive without your seatbelt enough, they just take away your license. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah, but you can still drive a car even if you don't have a license, even if you're driving. Like, it's your choice. You can do what you want. You can try to do that. Um, you're not going to be hunt down. I don't think it's going to work. Either. So, I mean, you could uh, break the law. What issues are at tension in these two examples? Why do you think it's okay to have a seatbelt law? Or why would you be willing to put on your seatbelt, but not even willing to, would you voluntarily enroll in this? No, no I don't want to. Actually, I have, yeah, I have, I have my Yeah, you say you have a life, right? You're actually more likely to live a long life if you sign up for the organ lottery. Explain that thought process. No, because if you sign up for it, then you can you get more sick than Jack. Well, that's what it means. So, does this make sense? In the same way that if you wear your seatbelt, even though the seatbelt may kill you, it's more likely that the seatbelt's going to save you. Um, yes? So, if you give away your organs, then someone else, then you become the person that needs. So then it's just like an ongoing Yeah, then it's a loop. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> no? If you, the thing about giving up your organs in this is that uh, once you give them up, that's yeah, it. Okay. Right. So, so why do we favor one person over another? Yeah, if you're a remember, do you remember who qualifies for the organ lottery? It's people who need one organ, right? And the whole point of the organ lottery is to try to save as many lives as possible. And the point of this is that the math works out pretty clearly. You save more lives in a world with the organ lottery. Do you at least see that the math works out this way? Yes. Yeah. Real quick, just have to wrap this up. So um, if you're like in an organ lottery and you got drawn to give your organ, does that mean after you give your organ that you don't want to give another one? Or could you philosophically end up giving one and then end up giving in the organ lottery, we only have a drawing if more than two people with the same blood type need an organ. So if you donate in the organ lottery, you're dead afterwards, right? Uh, I'm, all like, yeah, like, like, I'm going to stop you now. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't asked a question yet, so yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a good objection too, like the age one. And the usual response to it from an organ lottery uh, proponent perspective is, well, we can just screen out and say anybody who needs like a liver because they were a hard drinker, you can't qualify. In the same way that you can't qualify if you were over 60 or something like that. Uh, but when you say that, most people go, that, I still don't want to do it, right? Um, and I still don't want that to be policy. And the point of this is that a lot of times when we justify policies, we justify them on the grounds that more people live longer if everybody wears their seatbelt, right? The problem is that more people live longer if we have an organ lottery too. So if we want to explain why we shouldn't have an organ lottery, we need a better answer than, uh, well, I think it'll be dangerous. Because the whole point of the math is that more people live longer in a world where we have the organ lottery. Here's one thing you could say. Um, sometimes people make the claim that uh, you know, the reason we have the rights to property and uh, the rights to do what we want with um, our personal property, including our body, is that when everybody has private property, it makes everybody better off. Does that make sense? There are mutual gains from trade, etc. Um, well, what we see is, is in a case like this, it seems like if we restrict people's property in a certain way, more people live longer. But most people still go, I actually think that there's an aspect of our rights that are immune to this kind of utilitarian calculus. Um, I shouldn't be forced to give up my organs no matter what, no matter if it makes people better off. Um, so one way to get around the or uh, saying that we ought to have an organ lottery is to stamp your foot and say, no, 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 my organs are my own, regardless of whether or not you can do this calculus that shows that it makes everybody better off. Um, does that make sense? Um, 
So that's one way to answer the organ lottery uh, uh, proponent. Um, would anyone sign up for this if it was voluntary? I can sometimes talk myself into it in the same way that I can talk myself into yeah, the seatbelt thing. Uh, but then I think, no, I'd probably just rather risk it. Is that rational or irrational? <laughs> Yeah, because it's because you're consenting to possibly die as yeah. you would in the seatbelt situation. I agree, it's consent either way, but sometimes you make decisions that are irrational, right? Most people think not wearing your seatbelt is irrational. Uh, one last question. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of uh, someone asking me if gambling is not bad. Some people don't gamble. People who do can either win big or lose at all. Yeah. Uh, in each of these, though, I'm presenting you with gambles, right? And it seems like the payoffs are clear. Yeah. But I, and almost everybody, says, I want to gamble in the game that gives me worse odds. And that's what's kind of weird, right? In a world without the organ lottery, we have a lesser chance of living longer. <coughs> but I don't know about you, I don't want to live in the organ lottery. Does that make sense? Okay, so what I hope you've learned today is that uh, I have no answers for you on either of these questions. Um, what we do learn is that uh, a lot of our intuitions about the reasons we ought to do, the things that we think we want to do, um, these can break down and come apart if we look at them really clearly. And trying to figure that out, is, uh, that out is something that we do in philosophy classes. And so um, if any of you want to argue with me about this for much longer, I would love to do that. And you can come and uh, enroll in PPE and we can spend a lot of time talking about uh, why you're actually right about this. All right, now let me go back to this. <laughs> transition to Dr. Fike, but uh, we got, we'll just take a quick five minutes. So the restrooms are right outside this hall. If you want to refresh your drink or something, the drinks and the, I think there's still some cookies out there, but we got our big dinner coming up. So see you in five minutes.